All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. So, 40 minutes. I'm, I'm stressing out because I, I don't know how I'm going to get this done in 40 minutes. But I do want to tell you, I have a digital handout for you at the end. Everything is there. All the notes, all the hyperlinks, resources for you. Everything I'm going to talk about is there. So you don't have, even almost all, every image is there. You'll just have to either scan a QR code, write down the link, you'll do a brief survey for ICLE, and, and then you, it's yours. It's a Google Doc. As I continue updating it, this is my second time doing this presentation, this document will continue to grow. And it will always be there for you after you do the uh, brief survey. So it is there. One other last thing. I have a really tight deadline to catch a flight, so I have to run out of here. Please. Stop me if you have any questions when I'm up here, but I, email me, tweet me. I will respond. I promise. I just don't want you thinking I'm rude. I, I really do. I hope I make it home when my wife is going to kill me. All right. So what I hope to do in, in this short session, I'll also interrupt me at any time. Please don't be shy. Stop me. I'm probably gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to address everything, but this is your time, so please raise your hands. Stop me. Ask questions. What I'm going to show you is how we went from having a deplorable space in our school to creating one of the most engaging, authentic, relevant learning experiences for all of our students with limited funds. And I'm going to walk you through how we did it. I'm going to show you videos of what it looks like. I'm going to show you what kids are doing right now and give you, actually, you can actually sneak, take a peek at this Vine channel from the media specialist that's doing this makerspace, and you can see the amazing things these kids are doing every single day. But I want to talk about how we get there, how we do it. So, I guess it helps if I turn my clicker on. My name's Eric, I don't even really go into that. Uh, my email address on my website, it's all on my handout. Okay, so, what is the maker movement? How would you define maker movement? Anyone? Create, I think I heard energy. What else? What is it? What does it mean to you? Constructivist learning. Inquiry based. Opportunity to create. Student led. Very good. How did it evolve? Does anyone know where, when this maker movement sort of like came out of nowhere? Because it really is. Did someone say something? Think Magazine. But what do these people do? They were do-it-yourselfers. The evolution of technology has really empowered people to follow everything that you said. It's self-directed, motivated, value, creation. And you had all these individuals that were driving innovation in the fields of manufacturing, engineering, instructional design hardware technology, and education. And what you have is this whole niche has sort of exploded on the scene that really is just starting to creep into the field of education. And when you look at what everyone's doing, participation, sharing, support, not just embracing change, but driving change, using tools, Having makers make things that impact all facets of society, whether it be agriculture, banking, saving lives, lives. You have this new revolution that's happening because of the evolution of technology. And you look at how the maker movement is translating to education. You know, you have those learners that are engaged on all levels. They're learning actively by posing questions, experimenting, being curious, solving problems, being creative, constructing meaning, doing something. They're able to take initiative, make decisions. They hold themselves accountable for the results. Keep that in mind. In our pressure situation in education today, everything's driven by results. Kids are overburdened. They hate school because they've been reduced to a number. And when you look at grades, school's more about grades than is actually learning. The maker movement allows students and us that outlet to really focus on things that are meaningful for us, but we can do it in ways where we're not really held accountable. I mean, we're held accountable, but not by grades. 
Learners experience success, failure, adventure, risk taking. They don't know if things are going to work out. I'm going to show you how these kids in my old school are creating computers out of cardboard boxes from old technology and getting it to actually work. They form relationships through collaboration, communication, working together. The results of the learning, again, they're personal. They mean something. And they develop these skills that might not necessarily be able to be measured, but those skills translate into what the global job market demands. They get to design their learning experience. And now educators are sort of seizing on this opportunity the maker movement is bringing about. And when you look at what kids are doing in schools and districts that have embraced this maker movement, all of these attributes, all these soft, non-cognitive skills that are very, very difficult to measure, but they're extremely important to our kids because, because um, the way that reform is working, it's sort of removed all those elements that we found important when we were in school. And when you look at what kids can do, these things, you know, taking risks, they're not afraid of failing because they're not getting that grade. They make connections from one content area or one discipline to another. Initially, they might not even know that. They're creators, not just consumers of content. They pause, they reflect, trial and error. All these things that have elevated our country over the years as one of the most innovative countries, where we had all of these thought leaders, thinkers, doers, inventors, creators, we can now bring that down to our kids. Making is a gateway to deeper engagement, not just in science and engineering, but as I'm going to show you, it spans all different content areas. And one of, one of the you know, founders of this whole maker movement in school, Sylvia, she's actually presenting at this very time, I think. So hopefully you guys made a good choice by coming here to see me. Um, but this is a quote from her and Gary Steger's book. You know, the maker movement overlaps the natural inclinations of children to learn by doing. And back in the early 1900s, John Dewey was a huge proponent of learning by doing. So what is actually a makerspace? A makerspace takes all of those concepts that I just quickly went over and provides either a physical space or this whole concept of making to learn. Kids are able to use real world tools to build real world artifacts that they figure out the form and function. But they get to use tools that now are sort of isolated in the real world, but they're able to use them in school and create these creative projects. You can bet it in existing space, or it could be in a classroom. It could be in a hallway. There's so many different facets of making. But regardless of where the maker space is, it's where kids gather to share resources, knowledge, work on projects, network, and most importantly, build something. And you look at those elements. What do kids really want to do? What drives them outside of school? Think about how kids are making in virtual environments with games like Minecraft. They're building things that mean something. They're using problem solving skills, critical thinking skills. They're collaborating, they're communicating. And all of this, we can create an environment in our schools to take existing spaces that are just not relevant or not useful. And that could be a catalyst that has unprecedented positive impacts on kids. So, in a makerspace, create real world things. It's a shared workshop. There's no ownership of materials. Kids can go in and use everything whenever they want. Key is, you gotta give up control and you gotta trust kids. And you create this whole community of builders, makers, learners, thinkers, and doers. And I have to tip my hat to the one person that motivated me on all this, and that's my media specialist, Laura Fleming, who when I hired her, I told her, you know what, I want you to make a difference. And this whole maker idea was hers. And I'm going to share what I did not knowingly that empowered her to create this space. But, you know, for her, it's a maker space is really a metaphor for this environment that encourages the tinkering, the play, open-ended exploration. 
This is what was our traditional library. We blew it up. We stopped spending money on books that kids didn't read. And we stopped spending money on online databases, tens of thousands of dollars that kids never used. And within our normal operating budget, we put platforms for Legos, purchased a 3D printer that kids could use anytime, LCD boards where they could design or even play the Simon Says game electronically. She had different things on there every day. Simple, cheap, makey-makey kits where kids could turn fruit into workable objects. And school constructed bars where kids could use things like little bits. And I have all this stuff in my handout where they could use simple circuitry to learn how to make things. I'm pretty sure that I have a video coming next. And here's what it looked like. Have you ever thought the school library was boring? We'll talk to the kids at a New Jersey high school. CBS 2's Cindy Shu takes us to New Milford to find out what all the buzz is all about. Welcome to the library at New Milford High School, where there's a lot more than books. This is the brand new maker space, and we do mean make. Kyle Henry is using a 3D printer to make a phone case. He designed it on the computer, then printed out. He made this black one the other day. You could change the color. You have blue, black, white, red, green, and basically comes out of a phone case in an hour or two. Other students are creating video game controllers out of anything, even fruit. Tristan Tiangson, let me play along. I never played a video game with fruit. It's it uh, it a very interesting game. <laughs> I think we broke it. <laughs> Students can visit the makerspace anytime they want. Pamela Yashu built her own computer last month and loves taking them apart in the take apart station. This is a motherboard. Everything connects to this. Uh, this is a CPU, does calculations for the computer. This is a heat sink, which cools off the CPU. And the list goes on. The makerspace was created this school year by Laura Fleming, who runs the library, and says it's all about making learning fun and inspiring innovation. I've had kids go home and learn about things that they started in our maker space. And to me, that's, that's you know, a teacher's dream. And it has students dreaming big. Now I want to do biomedical engineering, so hopefully I'll get into that. And Makerspace has helped you feel that way? Yeah, it has a lot. It shows us all the different ways to build things, and it takes you through step by step. While the students love the Makerspace, next year it's going to look completely different. They want to keep changing it up to keep it new and relevant. In New Milford, New Jersey, Cindy Shu, CBS 2 News. Mm, and as far as cost, Fleming says you can create a Makerspace on any budget. Cost her school about $1,500, and she saved money by getting many of those things are donated but that is just I mean stimulating young minds our school blue-collar we had no money we found it in our normal operating budget by getting creative when we started this whole concept we really didn't know where it was gonna go a year later all of the different learning modules in the space are totally student directed they're making decisions on what they want those spaces to be and yes this was a high school example but when my own two children, nine and seven, saw this on the news, they begged me to take them to bring your child to work day. When I brought them to the high school, from 8 o'clock in the morning, school ended at 2.55, they cried because they wanted to stay. I dragged my kids out of there at 4 p.m. Because you know what they were doing? They were on a 3D printer designing Minecraft characters. They were making synthetic snow. They built solar-powered puppies. I know, it's a concept. I mean, yeah, they built little puppies. They created however they wanted, and they were solar-powered, and they moved. They created toothbrush head robots. All this stuff is not expensive. But the key is, you have to plan appropriately to make sure it's going to function in a place that supports curiosity creativity, risk-taking, self-directed learning. And through our journey, we've learned about some key components that are essential to the planning process. The first is the whole process of making. You want to make sure that a makerspace, or just even making to learn, is guided by natural inquiry, self-directed. It requires two skill sets. First, don't just assume that students are going to be able to use or know how to use the tools and use them safely. So there has to be some sort of a beginning sort of uh, guides 
on how to work a 3D printer. Because it got to the point where our kids go use a 3D printer without any supervision. What if the 3D printer breaks? Things like that. With our take apart station, which we've seen a few minutes, we had to label the different items of the computers before the kids could take them apart and rebuild them because they didn't know what they were. So you gotta go over the tools. And you also space the other skill is this, these problem solving and diagnostic skills. Kids need to figure out and be inspired and not, and sort of pushed, guided, when something doesn't work. Not to get frustrated, but to figure out a creative solution. The second is a dedicated educator. You need to have someone that understands they're not going to have to learn how to how all this stuff works, but they're going to have to be able to help students diagnose problems. They don't have to be a computer engineer, but if students encounter a problem, this educator needs to push them in the right direction so that they can solve the problem. There are highs and lows with making things. Things aren't going to work. Kids get frustrated. That educator has to inspire them to keep going. This educator ties making to different content areas, shifts from transmitting knowledge to enabling students to create her or her own solution, and being able to model when necessary. When you look at an educator that is sort of the quintessential maker educator, look at all these characteristics. They're not afraid to learn. They manage an environment that is very chaotic in a safe way. They help students build relationships, but they build relationships with the students. They know how to use various forms of technology. They're a tour guide of endless possibilities to learning. Why is that important? Think about what's happened in most of our schools. In the Northeast, there's no more wood shop, there's no more metal shop, no more auto shop, and no more agriculture classes. Those were those hands-on learning outlets where kids saw possibilities in these hands-on approaches to what they could actually do when they leave school because they knew college wasn't right for them. How do we provide those outlets when those courses and those spaces have been taken away? How do we show kids what's truly possible? How do we show them how making is an essential component of our economy. The maker educators a facilitator of feedback, helps with solving problems, and actually teaching kids that failure is not that bad of a thing. It's a catalyst for learning. Suggest resources, knowing where to get the resources, knowing where to get the items to purchase, encouraging kids to bring in their own resources and own items. And pro is a facilitator of producing, assessing, development, creating, revisiting, and revising. The third component is the space. So you have to understand the process, find that great educator, and where do you want to put this space? We did ours in a library. You could do it in a classroom. You could do it in a hallway. You could do it in a common area of a building. It doesn't actually have to be this one physical and mobile space. It's just that area where kids can follow their creative passions. And when Laura Actually, we created this space, and we saw the impact that it had on our kids. And we thought back and reflected on, you know, how do we get to where we are now? How do we get to the point where kids can just go into space without supervision? Because the way our building used to be, well, if no one's in the library, we lock it down, turn the lights off, no kids in the space. That was the mentality we had. Now, it's a space where kids come and go freely on their time. It's where teachers bring their classes and support other areas of STEM, engineering, physics, chemistry, home ec. All of them are now using the space to complement their curriculum. You need to understand your learners. What do they want? What do they want to be able to do? You have to assess your existing curricular programs within the school. What are the global trends that are happening now in whether the maker movement or just in this whole economy right now. Develop themes. As you'll see, as you saw sort of in the video, there was a Lego table, a little bits bar. I'm going to go over all this. There was a green screen in the back. Um, there was the take apart technology station. There were all these different themes. And the key was changing these themes up on a routine basis to really push our students and provide them so many different outlets to explore learning. Then, after you do all that, the last thing you should be doing 
is ordering equipment. That's the last thing you should be able to do or be doing during the planning process. And this is what I just said, basically written up. It's in my notes. So here are some items that I'm going to go over very quickly, show you how they work, how we implemented them. Some are pretty cost effective. Actually, the most cost prohibitive item is a 3D printer. But in my handout, I have three, two different ones. And one is a lot cheaper than the other one. So the first thing that we did, and you see this in so many different maker areas, kids love Legos. And what Laura would do, I mean, in this example, which was not ours, these are ideas, she would put prompts up to get kids to think and apply to their interests. There's also virtual Legos, Minecraft. So there's all these different outlets that are available for kids to build things. These are some designs that our kids would just come in and make. No pressure, and they would just leave it there. And the next students, group of students would come in, and they would take it apart and build something else. Remember on the beach, we built a sandcastle, and if someone came running through it, what would we do? We'd cry, we'd be mad, or our kids would come to us, and then we'd get mad and go yell at some other parents or other kids. You know, but again, simple prompt, sit down, build something. Let kids direct what they want to do. Let them get hands on. Another great component are little bits. Little bits are simple circuits that have natural connections to the fields of STEM and STEAM. Little bits come in this package. And I'm going to show you a quick video that shows you all the amazing things that all of us can do to build things that are relevant and meaningful. And here's that video. Now what we did is we had some sort of prompts that guided kids on things they could make, like make their shoelaces light up and things like that. But we had to eventually get away from that because we wanted them to come up with their own ideas. And that's the key of the makerspace. You can script it all out, which is a good start, but then you want them to you know, be like, well, you know what? I want to solve a solution for this. I want to solve this problem. I want to build something that's going to make my life better. And what we did is our custodians built this whole bar in our library. You could see some of the prompts there. And again, simple prompt. Sit down and make something. And that's what students would do. Makey makey kits. Another amazing, these are very cost effective. They're like 30 bucks. And you saw in the one video where kids use them for game, uh, it could be game controllers. It is so, I mean, I never even knew the amazing, all these things you could do. This next video will show you the possibilities with the Makey Makeys. My sound go.
Hi, I'm Jay. And I'm Eric. We're graduate students at MIT Media Lab. We have a dream that everyone is an inventor. So we created Makey Makey to let you invent just by alligator clipping. Alligator clips stuff like bananas to your Makey Makey. When you touch the banana, your computer just thinks you're touching the keyboard. The front has arrow keys, spacebar, and mouse left click. When you're ready for more, flip the Makey Makey over and you've got more keyboard keys and support for the mouse. You can even use the board like an Arduino when you are ready. No programming, no breadboarding. You don't even have to install software. Just plug it in USB. Order your Makey Makey today and start changing how the world works. So kids learn, have to learn how to set these things up. That's the idea is they make to learn. They're going to create a product that does something, but they're going to have to develop a conceptual understanding of how that device works and is going to lend to that outcome. So these are some things that our students did. Again, they made up the Play-Doh joysticks. And we had these. They could go pick them up whenever they wanted. There was a box of Makey's. So they would get it, and then off they went. And you can see playing the, just simple playing the drums, setting up on the computer. One of the most cost-effective solutions, we all throw out old technology. We stop throwing out the technology and we built this take apart station. Not just take apart. Take it apart and build something that works. This is an example of a brand new computer that students created out of a cardboard box that actually worked. Pamela, who you saw in the video before, got a paid job in our school district fixing computers last summer because of the work that she did in the makerspace. And if you want to see what's possible with kids, and this is in my handout, no one told students to start making computers. Oh, that's I'll show you later. These students created their own website. They share their designs with the world. The best part is they're encouraging other students all over the world to build computers from outdated technology and cardboard boxes and share their creations. They're taking pride in their work. They're not afraid to share it. They're building a collaborative network of makers. And they talk on their blog about how they're making them. How exciting it is. The one student I interviewed, he told me that he was a freshman, and he just started in September. School, the middle school, was totally irrelevant to him. He developed a whole new passion for school. Most of the students that are doing this are our special needs kids because they had no outlet. So some other great additions for a makerspace, Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is basically a credit card sized computer for less than $30. And what can you do with it? You plug it into a monitor and you can use a standard keyboard and mouse. It teaches basic programming skills, such as Scratch, Python. It's capable of desktop functions, internet browsing, spreadsheets, word processing. You can use it to create other digital maker projects, such as infrared cameras, weather stations. You give kids a Raspberry Pi, and you say, what can you make with this? Simple guiding prompt. And here's a quick video on what the Raspberry Pi looks like. This is a Raspberry Pi. It's a credit card sized computer that costs around £25, designed to teach young people to program and is capable of doing all kinds of wonderful things. Back in the 80s, kids had to learn how to code computers to use them, and as a result, these kids grew up with an inbuilt understanding of how computers work. Now, we need more programmers than ever before. So, to deal with this problem, some clever people came up with the Raspberry Pi to reignite the spark. It runs Linux, a free operating system from an SD card, just like the one in your digital camera, and it's powered by a USB phone charger. You just plug in a mouse and a keyboard, connect it to a TV or monitor, and you're ready to go. 
In schools, not only is Raspberry Pi a great way to learn programming skills as part of ICT, there are also dozens of cross-curricular applications like science yeah. and music. And all over the world, people are experimenting with Raspberry Pis and attending Raspberry Jam events, where people of all ages are learning what can be done with a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Since the first Raspberry Pi was shipped, we've seen examples of people using the Pi in a variety of amazing and interesting projects. Taking advantage of its size, portability, cost, programmability, and connectability. So whether you want to learn to make games, build robots, or even teach a bird to parachute, with Raspberry Pi, the sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. We want students to see what's truly possible. Similar to Raspberry Pis are Arduino boards. These are microcontrollers. They're not miniature computers, they're microcontrollers. And basically they use, it's an open source program for building electronic projects, such as coffee pots that will tweet you when your coffee is done. You could build your own robots. You could do all kinds of do-it-yourself projects with the Arduino board that again, is very cheap. You have that Arduino board, and you inspire kids. What can you make with it? We put a green screen, which basically is a green sheet. Students in digital photography, digital journalism, started creating projects that we never were able to do before. And they were so good, I showed my secretary the pictures, and she thought they were actually outside, taking pictures in a nice fall foliage. And it wasn't. They created on a green screen. And again, kids could go in there and use it, whether it was connected to class or outside of class. 3D printers. You have the MakerBot, which is very famous. That's what we had. Fantastic 3D printer. This is an Athena, which is a lot cheaper. So there's different versions of what you want, what you can afford. And what did kids do? We let them make what they wanted to, whether it be cell phone cases, wearables. This is a schematic model of the new student store that students designed three different models on the 3D printer, had the class bot and student body vote on which one was the best and then they created a student store in a space that wasn't used for 14 years and it all started with the 3d printer where they were able to go and have that autonomy to use the printer whenever they wanted to there are also free web tools that you can use Mozilla has a suite of free tools that most people don't even know about it you basically go under the hood of the computer kids do and they can learn how the internet works. Develop an understanding of all the moving parts associated with web design. And they get their hands dirty by creating things to learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You have x-ray goggles, which allows kids to look at the building blocks of the web. They have Thimble, where they can make all these interactive and personalized greeting cards, posters. They can make memes, and we all know the memes have just exploded as of late. Popcorn Maker allows them to supercharge their videos on the web. And Mozilla also has a program where kids can create their own apps for free. All of this is free. All you need is those guiding prompts, show them what's available, and let them make. I wanted to show you quick as we start to wrap up and I allow you to ask some questions. If you ever, and this is all in the handout. This is Laura Fleming's Vine channel. At any time, you can go and look at Vine videos of what kids are making. And as you scroll through it, she's got different projects of what kids are making. Those are the toothbrush robots. You'll see students making stuff. They're erasing the toothbrush robots. Uh, you can see they really liked it too. And you'll just see, again, all these different creations that kids have made. And that's in the handout. We also want to show our kids this is just not about engagement. Yes, we want you to focus on self-directed learning, but you want to know something? Making has a big component in society. So what did we do? We brought in guest makers. This is a guy who makes money repairing bicycles. He came in and showed students how to repair a basic bike. We brought in a local farm. 
in the town that our school was in and showed them how important their, that making was to their business. And we kept doing that. We kept bringing guest makers to reinforce the point that you want to know something? Making is important to you. And you can make, I mean, you could follow your dreams, make stuff, and actually make a career out of it. So there are key elements that need to be considered when you want to create an environment, make to learn. You want the environment to be inviting. You want it to foster curiosity, self-directed learning. So in our environment, ubiquitous access to Wi-Fi, charging stations for devices, access to coffee through Keurigs, couches for them to take naps if they get tired. Yes, our kids could take naps whenever they wanted to on their time. Games, a stress-free environment. Most of the time, students were on the other stations creating, making, inventing to learn. And this is what we did. Not just the comfortable seating, but creative uses of space. Limited rules. Rules squash creativity. We were flexible. The Wi-Fi prompts and guides and an environment that promoted trust. Lego Challenge. The TV show Big Bang Theory just announced they have released their new Lego set. Build a scene like this for your own favorite TV show. This is what we meant by prompts. We tied into student interests and we let them follow their passions. Leadership matters, ladies and gentlemen, because if you don't have a leadership that understands that this is a chaotic environment, that it's not scripted, it, people, the administrator is going to go, oh, no, you can't do this. We need someone in there. Kids shouldn't be doing this, that. Here's what we did. Here's what Laura told me I did. When I hired her, I said, make a difference. I gave her the autonomy to make decisions. I said, this is your budget, not mine. You make the decisions. She got rid of the books, got rid of the online databases. She freed up the money. I didn't challenge any purchasing decisions because the proof was in the pudding. Gave her the freedom to ex execute. I trusted her and empowered her to create a space that was obsolete. And things sometimes didn't work, and we had to fight battles with central office with purchases. And I was there to encourage the process. But these are things that I didn't know I did. Because I asked her, well, how did this happen, Laura? And she's like, it's because you inspired me to inspire kids. This is what the library looked like. This was our space. It looks like most of the deplorable libraries in our country, in our schools. Who wants to go there? Not you, not me, not our kids. This is what it turned into. So, you know, we need to leverage technologies, find these resources to engage our learners. And you know what? Regardless of grade level, expertise, it's all about connecting the kids' interests and then having that educator connect to the different elements, the different content areas. So, what did they do for our kids? It created opportunities for all educators and kids to rethink those traditional learning environments. And it comes down to is if you let them build it, they will learn. And we moved our kids from consumption to creation, and they turned knowledge into action. When you talk about how do you embrace this seven days a week, these are the questions you need to think about. And this is my second to last slide. It's in my handout. Think about this. The purpose of here is to show you what's possible. There's no script for a makerspace. Proper planning. Know your curriculum, know what tools you have available, talk to your kids, develop themes, but you know what? Figure out who's going to lead it, where will you create it, how will you fund it, what are the key components. I gave you a list. That's not exhaustive. There's other elements you could use. And how you determine the educational value of your makerspace. We did it by documenting the stories of our kids, by hosting countless visits to our school time and time again. And there's my handout. Questions? Comments? Yes? Uh, before school, we had someone in there. So they would come in around 7 o'clock. And then after school, we'd have someone. We'd do custodians where we'd usually just leave the door open. An administrator would still be in the building. Very flexible. Other questions? Comments? Yeah? Yeah. 
our kids went during lunch for the most part. That's when they, we had a traditional eight period day, 48 minutes, so kids would go during lunch. And then teachers collaborated willingly with the media specialists. So it was a very organic process that was always developing. In terms of the testing, we had that too. In New Jersey, unprecedented reform with our beloved governor. You know, if those my Jersey friends here, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. So we made it work. But once you talk to kids and you see those examples of these kids do, creating things that are just unbelievable, any leader had better get inspired because that's what we're truly trying to do. So a lot of it is persuading and showing those examples of how it can be done. Other questions? Going one, yeah. It changed every day, but you could say on average there'd be about 50 kids on average during lunch that would either bring their food or eat so quickly and spend the entire period in there. And then teachers would bring entire classes down. No, a lot of different kids. Different niche groups. I mean, you had the computer building kids that were always coming. But a lot of times, you know, students would also just want to be in that collaborative, chaotic environment. They would just come up, bring their computer, and work in the corner. Yeah. No, 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 no. She, no, 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 no. Only the ones that hadn't been read in like 30 years. No. No, 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 no. Lots of stacks, still lots of books. All right, everyone, I got to uh, shut down. Email me. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>